Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics in embroidery digitizing, which is blending and shading. Blending and shading is pretty much the reason why I got into learning how to digitize myself. I just love the way it looks. Blending threads together, all the techniques and textures you can get, it's something I really wanted to learn. However, when I started learning digitizing, I found that blending and shading was something rarely talked about, and I found it very hard to find information on it. There's lots of great resources on the basics of digitizing, especially on YouTube. You see lots of like production level stuff if you're trying to, you know, do names or logos on embroidery, but shading and blending is not a topic much talked about. It is more of an advanced technique, and I think it's more of an artistic thing. Therefore, you're, you're not really going to see it when talking about production, business-related embroidery. So me being all about artistic embroidery is something I wanted to learn. I've taken several paid classes online, and I wanted to share with you what I've learned. So here we have an example of a piece I created to illustrate blending and shading. I'm going to start off by talking about some theory and rules you need to follow if you're doing blending and shading. Then we're going to move over to the computer where I'll show you in Hatch how I went about digitizing this, and you can try for yourself. First, let's talk about some theory and rules you should be following. And I'll preface this by saying these are my rules that I follow. Maybe there are official rules that, you know, professionals actually use, but like I said, it's very hard to find information on blending and sheeting online. So this is just kind of what I figured out trying things myself and from the few classes I have taken. So here we have some example shading that I did real quick to illustrate the technique we're using. The first thing to note is when you are doing this blending and shading, you need to lighten up your tatami fills. So just to give an overview on fill density, here we can see on the far left, that is a full density standard fill, 0.4 millimeters is what most digitizing software will default to. We are going to be using anywhere from a 1 to a 1.5, 1.6 density. And that's going to be here on the right. You can see it's much lighter and you can see the fabric through the stitches. This is what we want. This is one layer of thread. But when you are doing blending and shading, we're going to be piling on two, three, sometimes four layers. And once you are piling on the different layers, you'll start to get a full effect. So that is what I did here when I did these shaded circles. These are all using three layers of 1.2 millimeter density. And as they pile on top of each other, they start to create the full effect and blend. Now, when it comes to the number of colors you're using, I like to use anywhere from two to four colors. My default is three. So usually I'll use a light, medium, and a dark color of the same shade. So if you don't have a variety of colors, then you might struggle when you're trying to actually stitch out the designs because it is very important to have a rainbow of colors to choose from. So what I was trying to achieve here when I made these circles was to show what's the difference of the order of colors. Do I do light first and dark last, dark first and light last? And the answer is, it depends on the look you're going for. So here on the left, I did darkest to lightest. On the right, I did lightest first, darkest last. And in the middle, I did, I believe it was dark first, light second, and then medium last. So the exact same number of stitches, but as you can see, the order that we place the colors is going to change the look you want. Alternatively, you can use two different colors. Here, I only used red and yellow. This first circle on the left was the red first and the yellow last. This circle on the right was yellow first and red last. And you can see we have two different effects. And if you think back to color theory, if you mix red and yellow together, what does that give you? Orange. And you can kind of see here, we do kind of get a slight orange hue when we've blended the red and yellow together. So same rules apply to color theory in art as when you're using it in thread. You can achieve a variety of looks depending on which colors you are mixing. Another rule to keep in mind 
when blending and shading is you're going to need patience. These designs take a lot longer to create than a normal design without blending and shading because you're piling on layers and layers of color. It could take, you know, three times as long as it would a normal design if I, if I didn't use any shading here. I mean, this design, just for reference, took the maybe six or seven hours, maybe more. Um, it's very tedious. I had to take lots of breaks. So whenever you're doing blending and shading, definitely know that it will take you a while, especially when you're new because you're still trying to learn how everything works. Also, really important rule here, it is my opinion that if you want to master blending and shading, not only do, are you going to be making the designs in your software, but you have to actually stitch it out in real life. Doesn't matter how good it looks on the computer, especially because we're blending colors here, what you see on screen is not going to be what you get. And in the beginning when I started, I would sew them out on my machine and the colors just weren't right. They didn't blend right. So I have to go back and refine it. For this design, because this is such a big design, I made some samples first to make sure I wasn't doing anything wrong. So here I just did a quick little sample of the flower to make sure that my pinks were going to be shading correctly. And I thought this looked good, but I didn't like the way my leaf looked. I thought it looked a little flat. So then I went back and I made these samples to kind of see different art styles and also what different orders of the color green would achieve when I did a final sew out. So that's one reason why this did take me so long. In the beginning, you're going to have to do lots of testing. Here are just random pieces I would create over the years to kind of test out blending. A lot of stuff in the beginning is not going to look good. That's fine. As you're going through and making more designs, you'll get more comfortable with the process and you'll understand what colors work, what techniques work, and what doesn't work. So don't be afraid to test your designs and know that not all of them are going to look great. That's all part of the process. Okay, so those are just some basics to keep in mind. Now let's go ahead and move over to the computer. We'll open up Hatch and I'll walk through step by step how I went about achieving the blending and shading in this design here. Okay, so here we have on screen, these are the circle tests I did that I was showing initially. So let's just talk about some of the settings that are important to note to adjust to in order to get your fills nice and light to get set up for blending. So just a quick note here, especially for the purple, I initially said it's really important for you to test your design out. One point that's hopefully illustrated here is by looking at these three circles on the screen, you can barely see any shading. I mean, you can kind of see a hint of it, but if we compare that to the actual stitch out, the shading is a lot more intense. So that just goes to show you how important it is to actually stitch it out in real life because this does not give me hardly any shading compared to the real version. So keep that in mind. Okay, so here in Hatch, and this should be similar for most, if not all, digitizing softwares, but let's talk about density. So just to start off here, so we can see here on the right-hand side, we have our density for this object set to 0.4, and we're going to change that to 1.2. So 1.2 is a good default to start off with. I like to start off 1.2 and then I can increase or decrease depending on the look I'm going for. So number one, set your spacing to 1.2. Number two, we're going to turn off the travel on edge. And then under the stitching tab, we're going to turn off the underlay because we're doing light fills on top of one another. You don't really need the underlay to add the stability. And if you have the underlay going, it's going to prevent the colors from blending into each other as you lay on the different threads. I'm also going to set my stitch angle to zero. So when I'm doing blending and shading, zero is a good default and, let, and then I'll change the angles later, depending on what shape I'm doing. In Hatch, now this setting is going to vary for depending on the software you're using, but we want to turn off the setting that's going to automatically connect the closest start and end points. So what that means is here, we can see my object starts up here and it ends down here in the bottom right. If I were to make another, let's say I make one over here. Now, 
And you can see my endpoint has jumped up here because it's trying to get as close as it can to this next object as possible. We're going to turn that setting off because as you can see when I did that, now my endpoint is up here in the top right and we have this line here. So what this line is, because our object is starting in the top left, it's stitching out here and then when it gets to the bottom, it has to jump up in order to end on this side. We want to turn off that setting. So in Hatch, I'm going to Software Settings, Embroidery Settings, and I'm going to uncheck Apply Closest Joint while digitizing. That way, as I'm placing other objects on, my endpoints aren't going to move because I'm going to manually set them. So in this case, if I want to get rid of this line here, I need to think if it's starting up here, I just want it to end somewhere in the bottom so that it doesn't have to travel backwards. And those are really the only settings you're going to need to be changing. Let's take a look, just a quick overview on how I achieved the shading here with these three circles. So we've lightened up our stitch density, number one. Number two, we want to make sure our stitch, stitch direction is all going in the same direction. So these are all a horizontal zero degree angle. And if I pull apart these layers, you can see that everything is going the same direction. If you want the thread to blend into each other, they have to be going the same direction. As soon as you change an angle, so right now I said all of these are zero. If I change the angle here, you'll notice this section right here, it's not blending in as well because the threads are going opposite directions. They're not sinking into each other. So sometimes you may want to change the stitch angle if you don't want something to blend into each other. But when you do, it's always important to make sure they're set the same. When I was doing these circles here, I was trying to achieve the look kind of when you're taking a drawing class on how do you draw a sphere and take into account where the light is falling and the shading is hitting. So here we can see the, these are good examples. This is a basic exercise you've done if you've ever taken an art class. So based on where the light is coming from, where the light's hitting, in the top right here, it's going to be the lightest. And then in the bottom left, where there is no light, it's going to be the darkest. It's the same principle I followed when doing this. And another thing to note is, depending on the density you're using, it's going to depend on how many layers you need. So when using, for example, a 1.2 density fill, if you want a full coverage look, generally you're going to need three layers. Three layers of 1.2 fill is essentially equal to full density fill at 0.4 millimeters. So if I stack these three layers here of 1.2 on top of each other, you can see it creates a full fill effect. That's what I did here when I was doing my circle exercise. So let's watch the stitch back and I can explain how these were created. Because I was doing a sphere, I started off with just a circle outline so I knew what my shape was going to be. And then I put down my darkest color, my darkest shade. I did two layers of the dark purple. So that was the first layer. And then we have the second layer going across the middle. So as I'm doing this, I'm keeping in mind, ideally, I want to have three layers of coverage over an area to achieve the full shell look. So with what's done here so far, we can see this far left side has two layers and this middle section has one layer. Now I'm adding my middle color, which was the medium shade purple, and we're going to cover the remaining area. So now we're taking note that the area on the far right is one layer and we have this layer here in the middle. We have two layers. So essentially, I'm noting that these back two layers right here are two layers, and I need one more layer going over it to achieve the full fill look, and that's what I use my lightest color for. So here we have our lightest color going over, and it's filling up this far right area, giving it a second layer fill. So now every layer on this screen has essentially two layers over it. As for the very last fill, I did the light color going over the entire section. 
and it's giving every area its third layer of fill, which is in, in result giving me a full effect and I'm not seeing any of the fabric underneath. So with anything, I would say the most complicated part for me when it comes to blending and shading is remembering how many layers do I have on screen because in a digitizing software, it's going to look very flat. So as I'm digitizing, I'm constantly moving layers to count. Okay, one, two, three, and I'm putting them back. It's a little hard to keep track, but it does get easier as you do this more often. Here we have the design pulled up on screen, and I'm not going to be redigitizing this piece by piece because that would take forever. But I will go through layer by layer, explaining the thought process, how I chose the colors I did, and how I went about setting my stitch settings. So let's start off by looking at my first layer, which was the green leaves. So when I did these leaves as my first layer, I did a 0.8 millimeter stitch density. And I actually did have travel on edge turned on because this was my base layer and I had the leaves covering the entire section. I was able to leave my travel on edge on and it made it easier. As you can see, if I turn it off, then I get those lines in the background because the start and end points are trying to join up. But when you have that turned on, then it's always going to travel around the edge to get where it needs to be. When I put all my, my layers on after this, then I had turned off travel on edge in order to make sure there was no lines. And I'll show you what I mean by that. But the first layer is pretty simple. The reason why I did 0.8 and not 1.2 was because this was a little bit of a darker green against the white fabric. I wanted the density to be a little heavier in order to prevent the white fabric from showing through the bottom. And then I set my stitch angles going opposite the kind of split off, kind of how leaves do. So you can see here, for example, this left part of the leaf was 135 and then the right part was 14. So I just set those kind of eyeballing it to split them out. Then when I did my second layer, I actually came and did the pink before I laid down the rest of my green leaves. So I did my green first and then I came in and put the pink down just to make it so I had a nice flat surface I was dealing with. I wanted to do the leaves first, but instead of leaving this a big hole where the open fabric could be stretched and pulled, I wanted to set that layer down so it could just be set and have to worry about it. So when I did this pink layer, I did a 1.5 density. And again, I traveled on the edge because we're doing it all the way to the edges. So the blending on the edges didn't matter. And when I did the leaves and the flowers here, I did apply closest joint while digitizing was turned on because I had my travel on edges turned on. It didn't matter. But after I did these first two layers, I had turned off travel on edge and applied closest joint while stitching. And that's where the manual work came in. And let's talk about that with our next layer on the leaves. So with the leaves here, this is when the blending and shading actually starts to take effect. So it's kind of hard to see here. So I'm going to actually change this color to yellow just so you can kind of see where I was putting these stitches down. So in reality, this was like a medium shade of green, but I'm changing it to yellow so you can see easier. So when doing the leaves, and I always find leaves to be hard to get that realistic blending look, I wanted to do a random fill. So I have my first layer down, which is the point eight, And then I knew on top of that, I would have one more layer in two different spots. So if we zoom in here, you can see I started up here and all of the yellow layer was done in a 1.3 millimeter sill. And when I was putting this down, I was noting the area that I'm not filling would be placed with the second shade of the green after. So for example, we have this yellow here and then underneath it, we can see the green. So when I'm putting down my third shade of green, I actually filled it up in all the spaces that the yellow wasn't touching to give it those two-tone shades of blending and making sure that we have the stitch direction going in the same direction 
it creates that blending effect. So let's zoom in on this one leaf to give more of a detailed look on what's going on here. Look at this first top part. We can see my starting point is here, and then my end point is at the top. So we're not using travel on edge. Let me show you what that looks like when I turn on travel on edge. You'll notice there is kind of a harder line here. If I turn that off, it looks more open. So if you're using travel on edge in a middle section, if I'm laying another color on top of this, or I'm laying another color right against the edge, it's not going to blend as well. That's why we want to turn it off. However, we need to be extra careful. Our start and end points are in the right spot. When I did this piece, I was starting here and I knew I needed to end at the very top. If I were to end, let's say in the middle right here, you can see now we have this line coming across because what this is saying is, and just to illustrate, I'll get this pink color. Pretend this is the direction of the stitch. We have the machine sewing in this direction. It's going. And then when it gets up here, it, I have my end point set down here. So it's going to have to make a line in order to get to the end point. And that doesn't look good. So I know I need to set my end point here at the very top. And then my second point is going to be down here. And this kind of just goes into pathing and hiding your stitches. I just did a running stitch in order for my machine to not have any jumps or trims. It starts here, ends here, and then it picks up into the next shape, starting at the top, ending at the bottom. Then I moved along with the running stitch coming down and going into the next leaf and doing the same thing, starting at the bottom, ending at the top, and going back and forth doing that. And that's all I did for this second layer. And actually, it, it, the hardest part about this was trying to be random and not doing every leaf the same design. In the beginning, the first one I did, every single leaf was exactly the same in terms of where the shading was, and it just didn't look natural. So I kind of have to force myself to mix it up a bit as I go through the different sections. So now changing that color back to the green. You can see it blends in a lot nicer. So after I did that color, I did the second layer. And again, I'll switch this color to yellow again, just so you can see it a little closer. And if we zoom in here, we can see. So if I take some of the things apart here, so this yellow here was the second layer I put down. We can see this was the first layer. We can see this right here was the second layer I put down and then the first layer. So as you peel apart the pieces, we can see they do kind of blend in here. And here's a better example of why we turn off the travel on edge. So we can see these two colors right here. I'll pull them out a bit so you can see them better. I have them kind of like a puzzle piece going into each other. They're both going the same direction. And I did turn on the feathered edge effect. But if I had travel on edge turned on for both of these, we can see they don't, they don't really blend into each other as nicely. So we have to make sure they're off so they feed into each other. And I just did that all the way around to create my final fill for the leaves. And then lastly for the leaves, I did the veins, which again, I'll switch it to yellow just so you can see and this is just using a light satin stitch. I believe I did a 1.2 fill satin stitch and just made those lines that go into the leaf. And that was it for the leaves. Now for the flowers, again, it was the same. So with the leaves, I did two layers. First layer was 0.8. Second layer was 1.3. And that gave me the full fill. For the flowers, I did three layers and then one layer of dark outline on the top. So let's take apart the flowers. So the second layer of the flowers was in this darker pink here, and this was done in a 1.2 density. I just did it in the middle of each flower petal, manually set the start and end point so we don't have that weird line underneath. And for these, similar to the leaves, I did the feathered edge effect. So here on the right hand side, you can see if I turn it off, 
the top part is just kind of even, but when you turn it on, it kind of gives a jagged edge and that again helps with blending. I like to use that feature a lot. And for the third layer on the leaves, we did an even darker pink just to highlight it to yellow so you can see where I put the shapes. I put it here on the tops and the bottom of the leaves. Again, this was a 1.3 density. And that's what I did for all of the fills. And then after that, for the outline, I did it in a dark pink. And that's just the final layer. You see, that was just line work. That was no shading. It was just to kind of emphasize. So for, for this, I could have done it in black if I wanted to give it a more like artsy, like hand-drawn look, just to show you real quick. If I were to set that to black, it would have given it a completely different look. It still looks good, but it just depends on what look you're going for. I have a bad habit of outlining everything in black, so I tried to force myself to not resort to black. But yeah, that is pretty much all there is to it. And one other thing I'll recommend is when you're doing blending and shading, especially when you're starting out, it's really good to look at inspiration work for what you're trying to achieve of other well digitized blending and shading. Me personally, I like to use urbanthreads.com and embroiderylibrary.com. They have a lot of great examples and their digitizing is great. So when I was, before I did this design, I went to Urban Threads and I typed in hibiscus flower because that's what this flower was just to see examples. And I grabbed screenshots of a couple of their hibiscus flowers that I liked. And as I use these as my reference, even though I don't have the actual files for these designs, I'm able to visualize and kind of see, like in this case, how they did the light in the middle of the petal and the dark outline on the outside. I really like that. So if anything, I highly recommend these sites. They're great. And they have so many designs, pretty much anything you can imagine. So definitely look at other work in order to get inspiration for what you want to do. And I wanted to give a quick little shout out before we ended this video. If you're looking for more information or you want to take more classes on blending and shading, I do recommend this resource here that I found very useful. So the website is learntodigitize.net. This website is run by a lady named Lee Caricelli and She's been embroidering and digitizing for many years. She's definitely one of the OGs in the embroidery industry. So I came across her website a few years ago. She does offer many paid classes. Unfortunately, they're not free, but I did, I did take a few of them and I actually took one of her classes on blending and shading. And I thought it was an amazing video. It taught me everything, almost everything I know. So if you are looking for more and you are willing to pay, I do recommend her class. She has a bunch of classes on her video. If we could just scroll through her classes page here, she can see her blending and shading. She has so many more videos on all kinds of topics. The website is a little old school, you know, not as up to date technology wise, and her classes are pretty basic, just recorded webinar. People can ask questions, but very knowledgeable. I actually have a lot of classes that I still haven't watched that I need to. And she offers great learning bundles. I think this is like I paid $150 and I was able to access all of her classes at, at least 100 or something. So definitely check that out. A lot of the topics I covered, she actually goes into more depth. So definitely recommend checking her out if you're interested in that. And that's pretty much all there is to it. So. Hope this is useful for you. I'll probably do a couple more digitizing on blending and shading videos in the future just to walk through my process, but let me know if you found this helpful and have a good rest of your day.